Hey, I'm Pastor Mike, and thank you so much for coming online and choosing to look at one of our teachings and, and uh, be a part of what's going on here at Church of the Lakes. But I just want to say this, uh, before you watch the video, it's very important to me that I express to you, I, I'm so grateful you're here, but I would never want this to be a replacement for or substitution for your involvement in a local church um, and your submission under a pastor who is called to be a spiritual leader of that. And so please enjoy, and, and, I, and I really hope that, that whatever message you're watching today, that, that God s just stirs you towards Him more, uh, that you're stirred to be more conformed to the likeness of Christ and be more like Jesus, that you're spawned towards what it means to walk in the Spirit daily and interact with His Holy Spirit, uh, but that it not replace uh, what it means to be in covenant relationship with a local church. And so enjoy today. Um, but I really hope that you're plugged in somewhere or in the process of getting plugged in somewhere. So enjoy today's message. We all ask questions. Why is the sky blue? What happened to all the dinosaurs? What was the best thing before sliced bread? But some questions are more important than others. How do I forgive someone even when I feel like I can't? What's my purpose in life? How can I be the parent God wants me to be and the one my kids need me to be? So where do we turn? To the one that has all the answers. We'll tackle some of life's most complex issues and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Everybody good? Good. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. Welcome. If it's your first time here, we're so glad. If you did not receive an experience guide, which has the sermon notes and a couple things in it, the ushers have them here on the side and they have a pen. If you raise your hand, they'll be happy to bring it to you. Bring you a pen if you need to write. Uh, please take notes. I love when people take notes uh, because you're going to remember it better. So anybody, did y'all eat breakfast this morning? No. Did you, I, I brought breakfast this morning. Uh, any, anybody like, anybody cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? Anybody? Yeah, I, I, I stink and love some Cocoa, cocoa Puffs because the best part is drinking the milk afterwards. Right? It turns into chocolate milk. Now, I, I, the reason I have some Cocoa Puffs is because I want to make a little comparison this morning to this other stuff I found here. Um, these are called Cocoa Dino Bites. This is crap, okay? Um, <laughs> welcome to Church of the Lakes. Uh, anyway, this is not your mama's church. Anyway, um, so I, I just want to kind of make a comparison here because... Um, this is this is this is um, hypocrisy. Um, uh, th this is kind of the, the whole generic thing. Uh, we had this whole argument with the worship team sitting right here just a little while ago, right before service started, about ketchup. Because some of them said that ketchup is ketchup. That's not true. Okay, I'm just telling you, if it's not Heinz, it's not ketchup. You understand what I'm saying? But here's what's funny is, we, so we all say in the middle of that conversation, we start talking about the fact that uh, I say it's not ketchup and it's not Heinz, and they're like, well, there, you know, there's certain kind of waters that you should drink. And I'm like, water's water. I'll drink water out of a hose. I'm thirsty now. I'll drink water out of a dog bowl. And then I thought about, like, what did I just say? Like, ketchup is not got to be, but water. Isn't that weird how we all have our different sort of like hypocrisies, does that make any sense, you know? Kind of here. So I want I just want to talk a little bit today about hypocrisy. Can, can we kind of tackle that subject a little bit? There's another bit of hypocrisy that happened in my home a few years ago. Um, so my wife's family is legendary for their sweet tea, all right? Because every southern, good southern woman needs to know how to make good sweet tea, not just sweet tea, but good sweet tea. You know the difference between sweet tea and good sweet tea, right? And, and those of you who drink unsweet tea, we're praying for you to get saved. Um, but but uh, so my wife makes the sweet tea, and it's such a big deal in in uh, her family. I mean, it's a big deal in her family. It's such a big deal that there is a certain kind of spoon that they use for their sweet tea recipe. And her mother did not give her the spoon until she got married. Like that's that's like what a big deal it is, right? And it's a certain amount of scoops of that certain size spoon that makes the sweet tea. So, I mean, that's kind of why I married her. You know what I'm saying? But um, that and she took me, you know, like none of the rest would take me. But anyway, um, no, but uh, so a few years ago, I sit down, I pour myself a glass of sweet tea and I drink the sweet tea and I go, what, what is this? She goes, it's sweet tea. And I go, no, 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 that is not sweet tea. What is this? And she got this little grin on her face. And she's like, I wondered if you would notice. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, I've been worried about like us eating bad and all this sort of stuff. So I put half the amount of sugar in the, in, the, in the tea. 
So I responded with what any good Southern gentleman would respond at that moment, and I threatened to call her mother. I said, don't you ever touch the sweet tea again, or I will call your mother, and we will have a conversation. No, but, but it's so funny how we have all our little intricacies, isn't it? Isn't it funny how we're like crazy about one thing, and another thing, like, I don't care, whatever. So I want to talk a little bit about hypocrisy this morning because there were several questions and I'm going to tell you what the questions were in just a minute but first I want to do this Let's can we take a hypocrisy test? you want to take a hypocrite test? Okay, get your notes you're going to need something to write with because you're going to have to answer some questions for me so I'm going I'm to ask you some questions and you're going to get an A, B, or C so I want you to write down don't be cheating now listen, listen, listen just because it's Sunday does, this is not a lying test either are you hearing what I'm saying to me? so give me the Sunday morning Sunday school answer Okay, the pastor opened up the, the, the sermon with crap. You can be honest, okay? Um, so so he, here's, here's some questions for you. First question, how good of a person do you consider yourself to be? A, not perfect, but trying. B, I'm an awful person. Or C, I'm pretty perfect. <laughs> write it down, A, B, or C. Come on, write it down. Don't look at me. You're looking at me. You haven't written it down. Write down your answer. Don't cheat. What is your answer? Did y'all write down your answer? You did? The correct answer is... Hey, if you wrote down anything else, circle it, because you got that one wrong. Got that one wrong. Okay? All right, so here, here's the next question. If you had the chance to cheat on something, and you knew you would get away with it, would you do it? If you, if you had a chance to cheat, and you knew, one, absolutely, it's not like I'm hurting anybody. B, maybe, uh, it, it's supposed to be it, uh, it depends on how much I'd have to stretch the truth, or C, absolutely not, it's wrong to lie, cheat, steal, in any circumstance. Come on, write down the correct, what's your answer? Your honest answer. What's your honest answer? Okay, so the correct answer is obviously C. So circle that one if you put anything else. Circle circle that, that one if you put anything else. Here's the next one. This is my favorite one. If someone cuts you off in traffic, what is your first response? Come on, what's your first response? A, I call myself and remind me, and, 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 and remember. We've all done stupid things while driving. B, I catch up to them and let them know how I really feel. I'll let you fill in the blank on how you do that. C, I can't tell you how I react. It's too embarrassing. Be honest, write down the correct answer. What's the correct answer? What's the correct answer? Okay, so the correct answer should be A, circle it if you got it wrong. Circle, circle it if you got it wrong. All right, here's another one, here's another one. If a person hurts someone you love, how do you respond? Oh, now we just got a little touchy. A, I get even as soon as possible. B, I avoid and stay out of it. Or C, I report it to the proper authorities and trust God with the outcome. Come on, be honest. Write it down. Be honest. Okay? So the, the, the correct answer would be C, obviously. Circle it if you put something different. Circle it if you put something different. Okay, go ahead. It's okay to judge someone when... A, when you're dealing with a complete idiot. And all God's people said? Oh yeah, okay, you can throw it down A if you say amen. B, they do the opposite of what you would do. Oh, that's okay, that one got touchy. C, I may not agree with their behavior, but who am I to judge? A, B, or C, what is your truthful response? Your truthful response, write it down. The obvious correct answer should be, C, although most of us said amen to A, called, you, called yourself out. Circle it if you got it wrong. There's, there's a reason I'm having to circle them, so keep up with me. There's another one. Yeah. If you see someone on the side of the road who needs help, what do you do? A, drive past without considering it. Who knows what can happen if you stop? B, pull over and see how I can help. Who knows what can happen if you stop? might need to concealed carry on that one. But C, keep driving and hope or pray someone will help them. What's your answer? What's your answer? Write it down. Write it down. Well, biblically, the correct answer would be B. Hopefully you're carrying. But anyway, uh, so, so circle if you got that one wrong. Circle if you got that one wrong. Do we have? Yeah, I think there's another one. If someone is talking trash about someone else, what is your response? Now, some of y'all just were like, oh, tell me more. Right? Anyway. A, if I don't like the person they're talking about, I'll let them keep talking. Some of y'all need to just go ahead and write down A right now. You, you know. B, tell me more. Tell me more. Or C, I shut the conversation down because gossip is wrong. 
What's, what's, don't give me your Sunday school answer. Write down what you did this week. Write it down. Write it down. All right, and then circle, right? Because C would obviously be the, the correct answer for us to do. If someone, if someone betrays you, what is your reaction the next time you see them? A, I smile politely with bitterness in my heart. You ever do that one? Hi, good to see you, jerk. Right? You like that? B, I smile politely with forgiveness in my heart. Or C, it's going to get ugly. <laughs> kind of like Florida State football. But anyway, um, which one? Write it down. And B should be the correct answer. So circle it if you didn't get it right. So here's, here's what I want to do. If you got one to two answers wrong, you're a hairline hypocrite. Okay? If you got three to five answers wrong, you're a heavyweight hypocrite. And if you are six to eight, you're a Hall of Fame hypocrite. Welcome to the club. Now, why in the world would you have us do that, Pastor Mike? That's a little weird and silly. Here's why. Listen, listen, listen. Here are the questions that I got asked. Here, here's a couple questions. Let me tell you, tell you the questions that I got asked. One person, and, and for those of you who are first time here, you don't realize, but... A few weeks back, I actually asked people, write down on the Connect card some questions you'd like to hear a sermon on. And so that's what we're doing. That's what this series is. This is all questions that have been asked from the congregation by you. So here are the questions that I got. One said, please talk about surrender. You're going to understand in a minute how that ties in as I go through this teaching. One says, how do I stay focused on Jesus? You'll also understand that. But this one says, and I love this, these last two came at the the idea of hypocrisy or being a hypocrite because we hear that a lot right like i'm not going to church there's full of hypocrites like that's an excuse for people not to go to church and that type of thing well it's funny because these two questions in my mind came from two different angles of this issue one question was this why does our faith uh, fall then climb then fall apart again anybody ever been there and what they're asking is basically a hypocrisy question right why, why do we like do well with God? We fall away from God. We do well with God. We fall away. Why do I do this roller coaster? So that was kind of a Christian question about hypocrisy. And then I got this question. Why do some Christians say one thing but act like something else? Amen. Right? So here's my point. The whole reason I just had you do that, um, that whole thing is, is because uh, we're all hypocrites. Yep. That's right. Every single one of us is a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite about ketchup. Now that might be a silly, stupid issue, but we could get deeper and talk about where I'm hypocritical because I'll stand on this stage and preach to you to love people, right? I will stand on this stage and preach to you uh, to serve our community and then I will get in my truck. And somebody driving in the left lane. And I ain't loving the community very much. You know what I'm saying? That's hypocrisy. Why? Why is it that every one of us has that continual battle. And that is the answer it seems like we hear from people who are either anti-church or that we try to invite to church and they're like, eh, and they're kind of arm's length, I don't want to do that kind of thing. Is, is, is this issue, is this issue of hypocrisy. Matthew 5 and 37 says, just say a simple yes I will or no I won't. Anything beyond that is from the evil. Some translations say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You've heard it that way. That's the same verse, right? We like real. We want the real, we want the Cocoa Puffs, not the Dino Bites. And our culture is starving for real. Would you not agree? I just want authentic. I just, I just want it to be, I just, I just want it genuine. I just want it, 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 because we see hypocrisy all around us. We want reality, so we watch reality TV. What's the problem with that? It's all scripted. It's not reality. It's reality TV. But it's a longing. It's, it's something inside of us. And I believe it is the image of God, which we are created in, inside of us, that is yearning for something real, something authentic, something, um, and I titled this message, Keep It 100. Because that's, that's a saying today. Like, I'm just trying to keep it 100. You see it on Facebook. You'll see the little, little emoji. It's just 100. And that's that's sort of today lingo of just saying it, keep it real, keep it 100% pure, just like this verse is saying. And it's, it's amazing because this is a continual cycle that we not only see today, it says like this is, this is old as mankind. 
Uh, for those of you who know your Bible, if you get into the Old Testament, there's this whole long story about the Israelites and the fact that they would do, they would love, uh, actually they would get into problems. And then they would turn back to God and say, God, help us. And he would give them a leader and they would serve him and do all the things. And then they would get blessed. And then they would fall off again and find themselves in a mess. And then they would cry out to God and he would send them a leader. And, they, and then and this, in, 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 in doctrinal terms, it's called the cycle of apostasy. And you can, you can put that in and see all kinds of crazy little videos about it, veggie tale videos about it. I mean, all kinds of stuff. The cycle of apostasy, this, this cycle that we keep going through. And I say we because it's all of us too. Can we just, can we just be 100 for a minute and be honest that that's me and that's you? That, that we're all battling this hypocrisy scenario? We're all battling? Come on, parents. I've done it. I'm like, rah, 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 about this one issue with my kids. And then I do something, and they're like, well, Dad, what are you doing? And I'm like, shut up. Right? I mean, because <laughs> I know what I'm doing is not right. I'm like, I'm a hypocrite, right? Because I'm a human, too, and I'm trying to figure out and do the right thing. Anybody else, or is that just me? Yeah. So, so what I want to help us with today, what God really put heavy on my heart this week, as I looked at these particular questions um, that you asked, is how do we deal with it? Like, how, how do we, can we get real with that and address it in such a way where we can maybe actually change the cycle a little bit? Anybody would like to maybe be just a little bit more real in your life? Would you, would you like to, people on the outside, you know, not outside the church or people at work that don't go to church, look at you and just go, you know, you're just kind of pretty authentic. You're, you're pretty real. You're pretty, man, I, I, I would love for people to just, say that about me and the reason why is because Jesus is not looking for a perfect person Amen. right he's looking just for available because it's not our power anyway it's his power it's the Holy Spirit working through us right and so, so I want to talk you through this cycle I want to help you this morning um, and, and, and this so this question hopefully there's some people here who are like really anti-God or anti-kind of church and somebody just like said, I'll buy you lunch if you come today and you came. And, and, and so rock on, I'm so glad you're here. Maybe there's some of you here and you're kind of skeptical. You're kind of like, eh, yeah, mom made me come or whatever. I thought I'd come check it out because it was free donuts or whatever. Um, and I'm so glad you're here because my goal today is, is to look at you and say, you're right, we're hypocrites. You're dead right. We are. We're, we're struggling to try to conform to the likeness of Christ. We're struggling really hard to be real. And, and, and you need to hear that. And so we would ask for your grace as we are starting to do that. And then for those of you, those of us who have been in the church for a long, long time and spent years in the church, can we be honest and acknowledge our hypocrisy? Can, can we acknowledge and, and be honest that, that, you know what? I have gotten so far away from, I've forgotten what it's like to be stuck in the mire of sin. Come on, some of you remember those days a long time ago. Like for me, I think about like living in the fraternity house and the, the boy I was, I can't even say I was a man. You, you understand what I'm saying? But I'm so far removed from that. Several years ago, I was, I was trying to kind of love on one of our young ladies that, that she struggling and she picking the wrong guys over and over again and all this sort of stuff. And I said, listen, you got to find your identity in Christ. And I said, all the right to pastoral stuff, right? And she said words that just pierced me, I'm going to be honest, because she was dead right. She said, yeah, Pastor Mike, you've been married 20 years. You forget what it's like to be single and lonely. And you know what? She was dead right, y'all. She was dead right. I was giving her the right words and I was preaching a bunch of stuff at her, but I forgot because I'm so far. And some of us, listen to me, we're so far removed from some of the life that we used to live that we've turned into Pharisees. Yes. We're so far removed from what it feels like to wake up in the morning and think, I hate my job. I hate my life. I don't want to do this anymore. We, 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 we've forgotten that time that we were fighting depression. And what we were going through. And so today, my job is to try to talk to both ends of the spectrum and all the rest of us in between. To say, if you're the skeptic, you know what? You're right. Don't judge God by me. <laughs> okay? Just because Mike is a weenie 
Doesn't change who God is. Right? Just because the person sitting next to you, like, they sing really loud and they're kind of a little, they were a little obnoxious during worship. Don't look at them. Just, no, listen to me. Then it changes who God is. Whether we hit the right notes this morning or the worship was perfect, perfect this morning, that doesn't change who God is. Just because a pastor has a moral failure or cheats on something, just because people fail does not change who God is. Is. So let's talk about this cycle a little bit. Um, I, I created a chart there on your notes for you, and I want to kind of walk through this. Now we're going to stop, start at the bottom left. There's a blank at the bottom left. Because where we start is bondage that you fill in there. Bondage, right? What that is, is in, 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 and we don't use that very much except for in really weird, like, pornographic things in our culture anymore. But, but this, the, the biblical concept of this, of bondage, is slavery. Is being chained up, is being bound, right? And so here's what happens. We find ourselves in a bad place. Anybody ever been there? You ever been in that place where you think, all I want to do is reach, all I can do is reach up. God, please help me with this situation. Please get me out of this. I, okay, I will finally go to church with that person who keeps asking me at, at work because I don't know what else to do. That's the, that's the place of bondage that we've all found ourselves in. And by the way, every one of these steps, I'm not going to read them, but I put scriptures by every one of them. Some of you guys like to do a little extra study beyond. There's scriptures beside each one of these uh, that you can go and, and read and study for yourself. So what happens is we make a decision to grow spiritually. So spiritual growth is kind of the next thing, kind of the next step that happens. And how do we do that? Well, we come to church. We get a little bit plugged in. We start reading our Bible. We start praying. And we start having a little bit of spiritual growth that happens. And so the immediate response to that that just happens naturally in us is courage, right? Like all of a sudden, hope comes. Um, we, we, we hear the message, the gospel is good news, right? We hear the good news and, and hope comes and we start to have a little bit of courage and we go, okay, you know, maybe I can do this. Maybe with God's help that I can actually do this. And finally you get to the point where you actually find liberty or freedom. I don't know, man, I don't know. For some of us, maybe it'd be healthy for us to stop this morning and remember those moments of freedom and you were caught in a mess and then when you look back now and you think about what God has brought you through and you think about the freedom that you have now as compared to where you were right because where there is freedom the next step and you're writing now I want you to write this one in is blessing see God blesses our lives so we go from this, this place of bondage to spiritual growth, courage, liberty, to blessing. And right here, listen to me, this is the key. This is going to help us. This is the practical part of what I want to help you with today in, in, in dealing with this process. Right there is the critical juncture. Because what happens, what is our natural human response when we're blessed? When we get some abundance? When we get that raise? When something happens? It is usually in our humanness. Well, now I'm just going to chill and relax. I'm going to kick back. I'm going to go on vacation. I'm going to buy myself a boat. You know what I'm talking about? Here's what happens. There's this thing that happens. It's, it's, here's the big fancy word for it. Cognitive dissonance. Let me explain that to you. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive is your thought process. It's just your thinking. Cognitive, right? If you go through a cognitive exercise, that's just a, you're thinking, you're working your thoughts. Dissonance, you know what dissonance is? Dissonance is a clash. Have you ever heard some uh, a group sing and somebody got really off key? You ever? I, let me say it this way: You ever been to a recital? And you're like, Jesus, please deafen me right now. You know what I'm talking about? That's dissonance. Dissonance is this is this clash. Dissonance is this. This, this, so cognitive dissonance happens when we find ourselves in abundance or blessing. Here's the cognitive dissonance. God is saying to us, I love you, serve me, surrender to me. The other side is saying, just chill. You're good now. I've seen this cycle over and over and over. I've been a pastor now 18 years. And I've watched a couple come to me and go, our life's a mess. Everything's a mess. We need to help Pastor Mike. Absolutely. So let's sit down. 
And then they expect like in one hour setting that I'm going to like fix their life or something. Oh, kind yeah. of that. Right? But I say to them, no, nope, we're going to have to work on this. So they come to church and they go through a marriage conference or they go through some kind of a marriage Sunday school class. By the way, we got a small group right now called Waffles and Spaghetti, which is for our married people. Um, so they go through something like that. The small group go through a curriculum, do that kind of thing. They see a little spiritual growth, a little courage. They find some freedom in their marriage and things start to be good. And now what happens? Well, Sunday morning comes. and I'm kind of tired. I had a long week. Like, let's just go out on the boat. You know what I'm talking about? You know, well, everybody sign up for that marriage conference. Yeah, but it's kind of expensive. I don't, I don't know if we want to do that. Eh, we, we'll be, we're good. We're good, man. Things are going great. We're good. Do you see what's happening there? That happens over and over in every single one of us. I'm not judging anybody. I've done the exact same thing. There's something about the danger of blessing and abundance that makes us relax. How many of you guys know, especially business owners, you know when things get really good and you put it on cruise control, it's, it's going down after that, right? When, when, you, when, you get, when you get your business to a certain place, right, and, and you find yourself doing well and you're actually making payroll and, and those type of things, it's not the time that you go, okay, now I'm going to go on vacation. That's the time for you to kind of kick it. And that's what I want to explain to you that we have a tendency to do, I think, spiritually. Why? Because cognitive distance, these thoughts come. And it's like, okay, look, y'all been working really hard. You deserve this. Or how about this one? How about this one? You get a raise. And your immediate thought is, now I can buy that boat. Now I can do this. Now I can do that. The problem with that is this whole time that you've been building up to blessing. You were dependent on God. Now all of a sudden, we stop depending on God. Now all of a sudden, we sort of step away and go, I, I, I've got this. You know what I'm talking about? Is it just me or is that? I've seen that over and over in my life and other people's lives. And to me, listen, church, this is where hypocrisy comes. Because we will start to sort of, sort of walk away, sort of step away. But let me talk about the cycle in the right way first. So we get to cognitive dissonance. We get to this place where we're getting these messages. Just relax. Just chill. Y'all are good. It's all good. You got that raise now. Yeah, you can go finance that car and pay $500 a month in a car payment. And we, these, this is when we make these decisions, right? These wonderful debt decisions that we make. But God is saying, listen to me. I am your sustainer. So somebody asked me the question. Hey, Pastor Mike. Talk about surrender. Listen to me. Surrender is not surrender until you surrender in blessing. Amen. Are you tracking with me? In other words, when things are going really bad, of course, everybody surrenders. <laughs> What's going really bad, everybody goes, oh God, please help me. <laughs> right? But when you get the raise... And you come home and your wife's got dinner on the table or, or you've got dinner on the table for her or whatever. Things are good. The kids are like semi, not zoo-like. <laughs> and you're like, hey, this is good. We're doing great, right? And we have this tendency at that moment to take back control of everything. In other words, when we get a raise, we don't have the first thought, although it should be here's surrender, right? Here's the difference between surrender and not. You get a big promotion and a big raise. To surrender is to go, God, thank you for giving me this raise. What is it that you want me to do with the extra money that you're giving me? That's surrender. Cognitive dissonance says this. I worked my butt off for this. I deserve fill in the blank. Hear the difference? And it's just that subtle and that easy in the moment of blessing, in the moment of abundance, that we walk away from dependency on God, which is that top blank at the top there, dependency on him. I've worked hard, right? I'm significant now. Um, the, the, the church helped us, but we're fine now. We, we don't need to go back to church. Um, what you see, listen, is more important um, than what you don't. Did you hear that? What you see becomes more important than what you don't. What I mean is what you see right in front of you, the temporary becomes what's more important than what you don't see. And the fact that just every business owner knows that when you relax in the good times, you're just killing the good times. 
You're just headed in the wrong direction. But we don't do it personally in our personal life. We, we don't stop. So let's talk surrender. Surrender is, God, why did you give me this raise? How do you want me to glorify you with the money you've given me? Right? God, you've given me this new house. You've given me this new boat. You've given me this new... Nothing wrong with resources. I love resources. Y'all like stuff? I like stuff, y'all. Right? Ain't nothing wrong with stuff. When the stuff is surrendered. When you recognize who the source is. When you go back to the place where you say, Why is it that you have given me this, God? Not I worked my butt off for this. Because didn't he give you the breath to get up this morning? Did, didn't he make the sun rise this morning? Or did you do that? I didn't do it. Did y'all do it? No, I, I think he did that. Did, didn't he give you the talents and abilities? Didn't he give you spiritual gifts? Didn't he give you all the things? He is, he is the life sustainer. He's the source. He's the reason why the worship team gets up here and sings. I talk to them all the time about three feet. It's really, three feet are really dangerous. This stage is about three feet tall. It's really funny how easy it is to get on this three feet and think it's about you. Right? It's really easy how I can get on the stage and I, I don't like, listen, and, and can I correct you on this one? I really don't like when people say I go to Pastor Mike's church. This is not Pastor Mike's church, y'all. This is Jesus' church. I just am the pastor right now. I don't know how long that's going to last. I'm going to do my best until he decides otherwise. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? That when we surrender, when we come to the place where we go, it's, it's all yours, God. This is your shirt. You want me to give it to somebody? I'll give this shirt to somebody. I like this shirt, but I'll give it to somebody. Right? I mean, with that is what it looks like. And so what happens is, is this, this is the cycle he wants to see us in, which takes us away from hypocrisy. That when something great comes and something great happens, when there's abundance, uh, when there's this abundant life that's promised in John 10, 10, I want you to have life and life abundant to the full. And we step into it because we go through those steps of spiritual growth and courage. And then we find liberty. And now we find this. And it happens that we would go, God, you're so good to me. How can I bring you glory with this? You know what will happen? Is actually, God will take us on a new journey. He'll actually take us back down to the step of bondage. And here's what I mean by that. He'll go, you know what? Let's work on this area of your character. Got a, got a little bit of a struggle here. It's good. I'm going to help you work on this. And you grow a little bit in that area. And you find a little courage in that area. And then you find freedom in that area. And then you see his blessing in abundance. And then you go, God, how do you want me to serve you with this? What is it that you want me to do? What is you? What do you want with my day, God? When was the last time you stopped and looked at your schedule and said, is there anything on here, God, you want to change? Is there anything that you want me to do differently this week? That's what it means to find us in surrender. But inevitably what we see as a cycle in our lives that we have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us break is what takes us towards hypocrisy. Because when that constant that cognitive dissonance comes and it says you, it's about you, you earn this, this is your, you deserve a weekend, you deserve a vacation you deserve, listen to me y'all be careful about those thoughts because those are not always godly thoughts, are you hearing me? sometimes that's the enemy sometimes that's dino choco bites or whatever that crap is you know what I'm saying? it's just something coming in and the enemy's trying to drive us away and take us from what it is that he has for us and that he wants for us. So what happens is we go, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go that way. I'm just going to relax a little bit. I'm kind of tired. You know, I've been doing a lot at the church. And I'm, I'm, they'll be fine. I'm not going to surf a while. We're just going to go on the boat. It's family time, right? God wants me to have family time. And we do this sort of little funny dance with God where we start to justify are you hearing me? Anybody else? Or is it just me? Y'all are real holy because I, I do this a lot. And what immediately happens in that moment is apathy towards God. I start to get apathetic towards who he is. I start to get apathetic towards the fact that he's the source. And it's amazing how easily Satan will grab me and pull me over to the area where when I'm in blessing, I think I did it or that I created it, or that I can even continue it, right? 
And so what happens is we get out there and we find our happiness in the world. We find our happiness on the boat on Sunday mornings with the family. We, we find our happiness in doing something else. We find our happiness in here, there, and everywhere. And you know what inevitably the next step is? It's dependency. But it's not dependency on God. It's dependency on the world. We get to the place where now we're dependent on the world for our happiness, our joy, our excitement, our highs and lows, whatever it is. And you know what that takes us right back to? Bondage. Anybody else been there? Anybody at all? Yeah, that is the cycle. And so whether you are not a believer this morning and you're wondering why, I just explained it to you. See, because we have an enemy and his name is Satan. And he's not a guy with a red tail and a pitchfork. He's not a cartoon character. He's a real spirit. He's a, he, he was an angel. Masking as an angel of light, as an angel of darkness, who wants to come and draw you away. But here's what's amazing about Satan. Satan never pops up and goes, Hey, I'm Satan, I'm here. Anybody ever have that happen in your life? If you did, you had to change your underwear. But, but the reality, he doesn't do it that way, right? He, he does not do it that way. You, you, you don't walk into situations and go, ooh, the devil's over there. He's subtle. He just scooches in a little bit. He just comes in a little, and that's... Uh, see, Satan doesn't need us to worship him. All he wants is for us to get apathetic about God. Amen. And if he can get us to that place, then here's what happens. Listen, here's what happens. Here's the hypocrisy in the church. Here's you and me struggling to conform to the likeness of Christ. That the reality is, is that we have some kind of blessing and then we get a little apathetic and then we try to still minister to our friends and we've got kind of our foot in the church and our foot in the world and we're doing this juggle routine. And then we say to some people, why don't you come to church with us? I'm not going to church because there, there's just hypocrites there. And we get offended. <laughs> there's hypocrites everywhere. <laughs> come on, you know you thought it if you haven't exactly said it. And the reason you got offended is because they were right. You're a hypocrite. What we have to do is, as a church and as individuals, and I, 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 we have to reach the lost. We, we have to. That is our mandate. It's the reason you're still walking around on this blue blob. So we've got to do something different. But we also need to find the ability to, to move and mature in our relationship with God. So if we are, guess what we've got to address? Cognitive dissonance. Right? We've got, we've got to address that particular area. And we especially have to address it when we are blessed. When we are blessed. When he has done something great for us. So let me give you, and I'm going to, I'm going to close with three ideas that I want to give you. That will help lead you towards dependency on God as opposed to apathy towards God when you get in those moments. Does that make sense? Are you all following with me? Am I making any sense? So let me give you three things that I think will help you. And from now on, this is what I want you to do. When you have blessing in your life, when God blesses you in some way, then I want you to look back and think of these three things to help you make your decisions about what comes next. Number one. Number one. When you're in that place of blessing, you've got to choose purpose over popular. You've got to choose purpose over popular. Here's why. If you get blessed financially, the popular thing to do would be to go buy something for yourself. If you get blessed financially, the popular thing to do would be to spend it on yourself or to have something or do something very worldly. That's the world's way. That's You should reward yourself. We say these kind of things to each other. Right? Listen to me, church. Maybe we should start encouraging each other a little bit better. You should do with that whatever God tells you to do with that. You hear the difference? Yeah. And so we have to learn to choose purpose. What's purpose? I stop and I recognize I have this for a reason. Can I, can I just say everything that's going on in your life right now is for a reason? If you're having some struggles right now, God's working on something in your heart. And so there's a purpose to it. The popular way of dealing with it would be to medicate it. Come on, I'm going through struggles. I don't feel good. I'm going to go to the bar so I feel good. Right? That's the popular way of dealing with it. 
right? Or I don't feel good, I don't like what's going on in my life, so I'm gonna go out and find somebody to hook up with. Because it feels good, that's a popular way. But the purpose way stops and says, there's purpose to my pain right now. There's also purpose to your blessing. Why is it that God has given you what he's given you? Choose purpose over popular. Look at this in Hebrews 11. Moses, the story of Moses is great. It says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. If you remember the story, um, or if you don't, Moses was a Hebrew. They were slaves uh, in Egypt. But his mama had him and sent him down the, the um, water in a little basket. And Pharaoh's daughter found him and brought him into the palace. So he got raised in the palace. Now, he's a Hebrew. All his people are slaves. But he's in the palace being treated like a son Right of the Pharaoh. Listen to this. Catch this up. 25. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasure of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Purpose. He knew there was purpose. Listen to me, whatever you're going through right now, and especially those of you who are sitting right now in some kind of a blessing. Let me stop for a moment and say this too. Every single one of you is sitting in blessing right now. Yes. You just maybe haven't recognized it. So let me help you. You have air conditioning right now. Those are pretty comfortable chairs you're sitting in. Wake up for some of you are asleep. Listen to me. You, you rode here in a car. Maybe it was yours. Maybe it was somebody else's. But you could have walked. Lucky nobody showed up naked this morning. You got close. You, 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 most of you, I think, probably slept under a roof last night. Now, most of the things that I just described to you are not normal in the rest of the people in this world. Did you hear me? You are blessed, people. You have blessings and you have abundance. Our problem is, is when we get in the comparison game and we start looking at everybody else. Yeah, but they've got a boat and they've got this and they got a bigger house. I mean, she, her kitchen is like four times the size of my kitchen, right? She's got a closet full of shoes, right? Whatever. Listen, and we start doing the comparison game and then we think less. And, and that's Satan's way of it. You need to change your mindset and understand your abundance. God has so blessed you. I just looked down and saw Adelia. Adelia goes back to, to deal with the people in Cuba. Are we a little blessed compared to the people in Cuba? She told me about the ration cards, right? They have cards. They have to go for rations. You know, like we hear about this, like the depression. Like they go and have ration cards for meat and bread. What about you? You got a ration card for today or are you just going to go wherever you want to eat for lunch today? How about, is that a blessing? How about we stop and recognize and go, God. Why did you put me in this place? Why did you give me what you have given me? And listen, I can tell you part of the answer is because he put you in this place at this time to be a blessing to this community. Amen. It's why we are here. That's why we are here individually. It's why we're here corporately. Amen. It's because he has given you a car and resources and a job and clothes. Thank God he gave you clothes. Um, that, that, that you could be a resource that you could love on, that we could serve. And so choose purpose over what's popular. Number two. Number two is you got to choose discipline over regret. Discipline over regret. We love this one, right? Everyone loves discipline. Liar. Nobody likes discipline, right? Nobody, nobody likes to be disciplined. But listen, let me say it to you this way. Sometimes you have to choose between two different types of pain. Sometimes you have to choose between two different types of pain. In other words, the pain of obeying parents now or the pain of consequences later. Can I get an amen from the front row? Amen. Yes. Right? You can either obey them now or you can get a consequence later. The pain of studying now or retaking the class later. Anybody ever had to do summer school? Don't lie. So come on, I want to see some hands. Any other dummies like me? Because I had to take summer school. But my algebra teacher, she was really pretty, so I, it was cool. Um, <laughs> I was a high school punk. Um, pain, listen, pain saying no to temptation now, or the pain of trying to beat addiction later. It's not a matter of 
whether it's okay for you to drink, it's a matter of can you handle it? Come on. I know I just stepped in there a little bit. I know. It's not, it's not even okay for you to do these things. It's is there a history in your family that there might cause be problems. So it's just better for you to stay away. Right? That's discipline. The pain of living within your means as opposed to climbing the debt ladder later. Right? Come on, church. Listen to me. I, and, and you'll hear me this. You guys haven't heard me talk a lot about money since we launched the church. But I am a debt-free guy. Okay? I, you need to be debt-free. You need to be free because that's just bondage, y'all. We need to live within our means. You need to set a budget. Can I just tell you, since we bought Jen and I in 1996, 97, 1997, we bought a Honda Civic and we financed it. Stupid. And, and, um, but ever since then, we have paid cash for every car we own. And you can do that too. And you need to do that. Because that's bondage. Right? The discipline. You have plenty. Live within your means. Set a budget. You need help with that? I would love to help you. I'm a budget guy. Like, I have people come to me all the time and go, Pastor Mike, help me the budget. I'm like, yes, here we go. Right? I, I, I do because I love to see people get out of debt, live within their means. You, you have got to choose the discipline now instead of the regret later. So when you get that raise, when you get that new promotion or that new opportunity, listen to me. Don't go buying a bunch of stuff. Think. What is it, God, that you want me to do? How is it that you... I choose the pain of discipline over the pain of regret. That's my desire for you. See, discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. I'm going to say that one more time. Discipline is between choosing now what you want now and what you want most. 1 Corinthians 9, 9 says, Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. Come on, somebody. I'm preaching about 73% y'all answering right now. I'm just saying. Right? We, there's an eternal prize that we have that, that is waiting for us. If we will discipline ourselves and we will choose purpose and we will choose discipline in what we do and surrender ourselves, understanding that all blessings only come from God. Number three, and then I'm going to close this out. Number three, choose important over urgent. Choose important over urgent. Let me read you one last story, Luke 10. Most of you know this story, but uh, there's two sisters. It says this in Luke 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Can you picture that? Some of you got siblings. Can you picture your siblings? Right? I had to double check. They're not in here. Yeah, we had a little sibling war at my house this morning. One sitting at the feet of Jesus saying, I just want to hear you. And what is so busy doing life and doing all this stuff? Let me ask you, how about you? Because we've got to come to a place where we choose important over urgent. See, in business, calming an angry customer is urgent. But building systems to keep customers from getting angry is important. The difference. Getting your car engine repaired is urgent, but changing the oil so it doesn't need to be repaired is important. Amen. Getting help when you're sick is urgent, but taking care of yourself so you don't get sick is important. Are you catching on? Choose the important over the urgent. If you do important, you won't have as many things that are urgent. Well, if I have time, I'll work out. Well, if we have time, maybe we'll go on a date night. One day, we'll, we'll, we'll take that kid away with the family. And we'll do a family vacation. I wish we had time for fill in the blank. Can I say this to you? You have time for whatever you choose to have time for. And I'm imploring you this morning. I'm imploring you to pick the important over the urgent. 
And I know this sounds self-serving. But can I tell you what's important for your kids? That they're in church every week. Not because Pastor Mike's talking. But because God is talking. And all week long, every, every day, while you're hearing messages, you know what those messages are? Cognitive dissonance. Don't worry about this. Don't do it that way. Let's choose the popular, not purpose. Let's, let's, let's just deal with the urgent because you're in chaos right now because we don't take time to do the important. And so here's my challenge. And I'll close with this and we'll pray. But my challenge to you is this. For those of you who would say, I don't like church, and maybe when somebody will watch, I'm going to look at the camera. Maybe one of you is watching online. Maybe it's not even today. It's later on. You catch it on our site. And you would look and say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. And I would say, yes, we are. Here we are. We would love for you to come join us. Because we're in a battle just like you. We're trying to figure out what it means to do the right thing. Here's one difference. i got Jesus on my side. I have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of me, which raised Jesus from the dead. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so my challenge is to you to this. Come, be a hypocrite with us as we grow and learn and overcome this crazy cycle in our life. Now for our church people, let me say this to you. How about you? What area would you be honest enough this morning to go, I didn't surrender. I took the blessing. I got apathetic. I kind of walked away. So what is the next step for you? I like next steps. I don't like to come to church and preach a message that everybody gets in the car because, oh, that was so good. Loved it. That was awesome. And he made us laugh. I love Cocoa Puffs. That is not my goal. My goal is to try to get you to take a step. That's my goal. What is your next step? What is it, what is it that you need to surrender today? What, what is it that you need to go, you know what, God, this is yours. I took control of this. I've gotten apathetic. But what is it about your time, your schedule, coming to church, being regular for your kids, getting your teenagers to youth group on Wednesday night? I got some great small group of leaders that are speaking life into your teenagers. What is, what is it that we need to surrender? What is it that you need to surrender? So would you close your eyes for just a second? Let's think about that. Would you, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us this morning? Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We come with a repentant heart, God. Forgive us. We recognize this battle within us. We recognize this cycle. Many of us recognize we're kind of in that place of apathetic. We get more excited about Friday night than we do Sunday morning. we're looking for our thrills in the world. We're dependent on the world instead of upon you. So would you speak to us individually? What area? Where, where is it that we should surrender something to you? How do we get back to this place where we just go palms up and say, it's all about you, Jesus. It's for your glory. Everything I have is yours. Do what you wish with it all. Speak to me. Help me to understand what it is that you want me to do. With your eyes closed and your head still bowed, i got to give the opportunity for you that may have never surrendered your heart to Jesus. Whether you're here or online, and you've never had that moment where you go, okay, well, now I understand. You're not, we're not, God's not looking for perfect, and you're not expecting me to be perfect. The church doesn't think I'm going to be perfect. No, we don't. But he just wants you to surrender to Jesus because he's got a much better plan for you. And so the way you do that to surrender your life is you just make that statement. The scripture says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that he was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. And so I'll pray a prayer, but you have to put the heart behind it. You have to put the sincerity to it. The prayer would be something like this. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Even though I'm a mess. Thank you for loving the hypocrite. Thank you for loving and desiring greater things for my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I choose to surrender as best as I know how today. I, I, I choose to surrender my life to you. 
Holy Spirit, come into my life and change me and make me more like you. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all kinds of people say, Amen. 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 Would you do me a favor? Would you grab a Connect card? It's, in the, it's right there in your experience guide. And do you want you to respond in some way today? Multiple ways you can respond for things. Uh, one of your first time guests, again, welcome. We're glad you're here. We made it really easy. I don't know if you've ever been and filled out one of those forms. That's one of the reasons I think people don't want to be a first time guest, because you got to fill out a form. It's got like your blood type and your mother's maiden name. And, you know what I'm saying, kind of thing? So all that's on there is your name, email, and phone number. That's all we want. So we make it really, really easy. So would you fill that out for us and mark? I'm a first time guest, and we're so glad you're here. Some of you need to mark today. It says, I have made a decision to follow Jesus. And if you did that today for the very first time, would you mark that so we know? Uh, we're not going to embarrass you or do anything, but we do have a gift for you. And we would like to help you in that process and what that means. And if you feel less than, if you feel, yeah, but you don't know my past, trust me, you don't know mine either. You understand? You're okay here. Can, can I say this to you? It's okay to not be okay here at Church of the Lips. We love you right where you are. So would you mark that and let us know? Um, if you if you would like to sign up like for the first responders dinner, we're going to be feeding all the police and firemen on 9-11, um, just as an appreciation for them. Any of the other announcements that you've seen, you can sign up there. But on the back is a prayer request, and the whole thing is just blank, so that you can write prayer requests. So the prayer team comes every Tuesday morning and prays over all the prayer requests. If it's confidential, if it's an issue you want just me to see, you can mark confidential. I'll take that card, and, and we'll be really careful uh, with your personal information. I promise you, I promise you. So if you would, just fill out that card. And uh, as you finish that card, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. The ushers are coming now. Um, they're going to bring down the buckets. And as they pass the buckets, you can drop in your tithes and offerings and your Connect card. Because of your generosity, we are excited to begin supporting Fully Equipped Oasis in Berlin, Germany, staffed by veteran missionaries Christy and Franz Martins, who understand the unique challenges presented by cross-cultural ministry. The Fully Equipped Oasis offers biblical instruction, life coaching, encouragement, and the time and space needed for spiritual renewal. Christy and Franz lead pastors who have experienced burnout in ministry to reflect and heal in the presence of Jesus. We are so grateful for your faithfulness in giving that allows us to go and support ministries that equip those who go to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't forget to drop your experience guides in the bins after the service. Thank you for being part of the Lakes Legacy.